بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله Thank you all for uh, being here I know uh, it's a busy time the weekends we spend usually with family or other obligations but I appreciate any time you come out Alhamdulillah This is our fourth session So for those who don't know our first three sessions are available uh, on the um, on MCC's Facebook page and their YouTube page so inshallah you can always check out um, what was covered before if you're just now coming or if you haven't had a chance to see those those are inshallah available to you but I do um, like to sort of summarize at least the previous session um, uh, at the beginning of every session because I want you to kind of follow the conversation as we're um, having it so um, the outline uh, here's the outline. We'll do, do a summary um, of uh, the last session where we talked about leadership basics in Islam and then defining basic human needs. And then we'll get to what the context of that, inshallah. And then um, we'll also talk about the risks and dangers, um, things that parents should be aware of and prepared for when uh, just uh, looking out for what's, you know, different stages um, uh, of uh, where their children are at to know what to expect and how to protect them. Uh, so we'll go ahead and begin. Um, alhamdulillah. So in our very first session, we talked about two hadith. Uh, we talked about the hadith uh, of Prophet Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an rayyati, which is uh, each of you is a shepherd and you are responsible for your flock. Right? It's a lengthy hadith, but it kind of goes into the different roles that every person, every Muslim has, and, and the different sort of hats we wear. And then um, also, uh, which uh, is whoever knows himself knows his Lord. So this is sort of you know the theme, uh, the two hadith that really um, kind of outline the theme of these workshops, because we're uh, first of all getting. You know, back to the basics as far as really identifying the, the leadership uh, qualities necessary uh, to be effective parents. So that's where the first hadith comes in. And then also how that ties into, uh, you know, really becoming aware of oneself and teaching that to our children to become very in touch with who they are so that it strengthens um, their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is ultimately our objective, right? So. Here in this particular slide, we've talked about, and the parts that are underlined are um, what we've covered so far. So we talked about some basic leadership skills um, that will obviously translate to effective parenting are to first understand yourself well. So a lot of times, obviously, when you come to a parenting class, you feel like their focus is going to be on children, which yes, it will be eventually, but we want to start with ourselves first because how you parent is very much going to be determined by uh, as a reflection of where you are right if you are um, in a state of, of, of you know in a good state you know in a state of spiritually uh, physically emotionally mentally then inshallah your parenting will follow through but if you yourself um, have a lot of uh, you know issues going on that you haven't yet tended to then obviously that's going to impact your parenting so you always want to look at yourself first and really sort of get to the core of how, why you parent the way you parent, how you parent, where did you learn your parenting, uh, you know, skills from, um, was it, you know, are you just repeating uh, things that you, were done to you, um, have you done the reading and the, you know, sort of education into parenting that, that's, that should have been done from both an Islamic perspective um, as well as just general parenting tips. Uh, so kind of just again identifying that, but also your own needs as a human being, you know. Children, as we know, mashallah, they're demanding, you know. They, they're even, you know, a little tiny infant requires so much, right, attention, so much focus. Um, and so if you um, neglect your own needs uh, it's, and, and don't realize where, what you need in order to be effective, it's obviously going to possibly impact again your parenting so being really in touch with what you need do you need um, more self-care do you need help do you need to be more uh, you know clear in your communication do you need to uh, work with a professional uh, you know to help you maybe you and your spouse need some guidance along the way um, so there's a lot of things that you have to identify 
And then obviously understanding the, the needs of those in your care is very important as well, which we talked about in previous sessions. So you can go back to the um, previous recordings and check those out to really talk, uh, you know, kind of we, we discussed, for example, um, actually going back to uh, knowing yourself well, and then eventually, um, you know, knowing the needs of those in your care. One of the things we talked about was really um, getting in touch with one's temperament, right? So we talked about the four temperaments in Islam and uh, being really in tune with how, you know, you are. Are you a reactive person? Are you a person that um, is uh, slow to react, quick to react? Do you, are you really analytical and critical or are you more engaging and social, extrovert, introvert? All these things that measure personality types are really important for you to know about yourself, but then also to look at your children and to identify their strengths and maybe areas that they might need help with. Um, and so when we talk about the needs of those in your care, these are things we're talking about. In addition to the physical needs, which actually are things that we really um, focused on in our very last session. Uh, so these are, um, you know, kind of the, again, the topics that we, we've covered so far, and we'll again continue with the review in a little bit. But what we're going to talk about today specifically is the next section here, which you see in the list. And for those of you who are watching, it's um, understanding potential dangers and threats, because obviously, Part of, again, um, if you think back to our first session when we talked about the analogy of the shepherd, right? We said that the shepherd's role is to protect his or her flock, and that is not just providing and nurturing and taking care of them, but also knowing imminent dangers, being prepared for danger. So part of um, our job as parents is really being ahead in this regard. Um, and I, you know, there's so many things that come up um, that I think you know a lot of parents are, are really, really stressed about today that have to do specifically with this topic. I would say more than anything, this is the area that parents are really struggling with because they are kind of in the midst of, 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 of something that they don't know how to resolve. That it's, it's a, They perceive it as a potential danger or threat that their child is going through something. And we'll talk about that, inshallah. Um, but they're kind of lost. And so, um, again, effective parenting is you know this beforehand. You, you study into this, you read into this, you look at the articles, you, you look at the data, you look at the research, you, you really try to get ahead and see what's going on with children. Um, like, you know, I just was telling a sister a few minutes ago that the, earlier this week, um, there was a news report, I think, put out by CBS, which was fascinating, but it was, um, you know, they were. Uh, uh, speaking to um, some researchers who are actually uh, looking at the effects of devices, of video games, social media on the brains of children, and they're actually, I think it's a 10-year study that they're going to do with um, you know, a few hundred different children. They're going to monitor them over 10 years and kind of see what exactly is going on with their brains. But already, in the preliminary sort of tests that they've done, they've seen changes are happening just from these devices that they're, you know, the brains of a child who's actively engaged in, uh, you know, in, in looking at um, you know, devices or you know, being on devices is different than a normal child that's not. So you know, there are definitely alarming things that, are already, um, that we should know about, but to follow things like that um, and to really kind of be ahead of the research would be one example of being um, informed and being effective in terms of really knowing these uh, threats and dangers. So we'll talk more about that. But just to kind of, again, summarize, um, you know, the needs. You know, we've, we've really talked about needs. Knowing your needs, knowing the basic needs of, uh, of the people in your care. Um, we said, you know, last time, for example, we asked what are basic human needs, right? What are they? Right, food, right, air, water, shelter, love. These are basic human needs. Um, but then there's also needs I mean, those are survival needs, right? And we are, we're all pretty, I think, versed in survival needs because we have to be. We, we need to survive. So uh, we know those. But what about thriving as a human being to excel, to get better? This is what we, um, we want to focus on, right? So you, if you know how, what the needs are in terms of surviving, alhamdulillah, but now let's focus on what are the needs in terms of becoming better, becoming a more actualized person which we'll get to so we said um, this was a quote from Abraham Maslow who is a, an American psychologist and he came up with this theory called a hierarchy of needs but this is a quote from him from him he said for the man who is extremely and dangerously hungry no other interest exists but food life itself tends to be defined in terms of eating anything else will be defined as unimportant 
freedom, love, community feeling, respect, philosophy may all be waved aside as fripperies which are useless since they fail to fill the stomach. Such a man may fairly be said to live by bread alone. But what happens to man's desires when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? At once other and higher needs emerge, and these, rather than physiological hungers, dominate the organism. And when these in turn are satisfied, again new and still higher needs emerge and so on. This is what we mean by saying that the basic human needs are organized into a hierarchy of relative prepotency. So he identified um, these, and, and, and it's kind of, a, if you want to read it uh, from the bottom going up, but he, his theory was basically that if you satisfy any human being's basic physiological needs first, right, then their next needs that you want to, that, that they're naturally going to want to have met are safety, right, um, and then love and belonging, and then esteem, and then self-actualization. So it, it works in this hierarchy. And if at any point a need isn't being met somewhere in this hierarchy, then we're stunted. Our growth, uh, our developmentally, in terms of you know just be, becoming the better versions of ourselves, is stunted because of that. And so this is important to understand because a lot of our stress, right? Um, I'm sorry, which one? Uh, physiological so physiological needs are like we said food water air sleep right the very basic so I know the graph oh actually I'm sorry the graphic is here so the graphic is um, it's small um, but you can kind of get it here it's just yeah basic breathing food water air and all the necessities just to, to exist and then security would be or safety would be security of body uh, of employment of resources okay of uh, the health of your property. So this is really important because if you look at a lot of the stress that parents are under, I would say a lot of it has to do with maybe this second need, right? Safety. A lot of parents um, have a difficulty, you know, especially here in the Bay Area, we live very, very stressful lives, right? Uh, getting from one place to another is difficult, work, uh, just family. It's just, it's just an intense environment to live in. So a lot of people may it may be that their safe, their need for safety, uh, as you know described by this uh, sort of hierarchy, isn't being met, and therefore just kind of if you think about that, how is it going to impact their parenting, right? So you want to look to yourself and say, where am I? This is what it means to get in touch with your needs. Where am I in this hierarchy? Are my needs being met, or am I, uh, you know, is there something missing? And therefore, it's actually you know, kind of seeping into my relationships. You know, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit more, um, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, on edge uh, when it comes to my household. So I walk into the house and I bring in all that stress and negativity because this very basic human need isn't being met. And then beyond that, you know, once though, alhamdulillah, these needs are met, what, is the, what does it say? It, then you move on to the next basic need, which is love and belonging. So, peop, so basically, if, you, if your basic physiological needs are being met, and then alhamdulillah, your, your safety and security and sense of security is being met, then the next thing that you naturally are going to want to uh, pursue is love and belonging. So you start to focus on your relationships more. You know, it's really hard for someone, for example, who's having financial difficulty to maybe focus on you know extended family relationships right they're like i I'm, i need to work i need to survive i can't go visit you know this family member and this family member and this family member right but alhamdulillah if you have a certain sense of safety in that regard then you're like more you know likely to be open to uh to um to to working on you know relationships and then in, in, once inshallah you feel like alhamdulillah you know your relationships you kind of have a certain um you know, uh, rhythm there, and you're you're able to manage those relationships. Uh, you know, you have friendships that are secure. Your family life, alhamdulillah, is going well. Then the natural um, need that you want to meet next is your esteem, and this has to do with you, now you're looking more inward, right? Like all my other external responsibilities, obligations, alhamdulillah, I've taken care of them. Now I want to start, you know, working on myself. So this is where you might want to pursue uh, more mastery of, of different things, whether it's taking on classes or um, skill sets, maybe um, as being a little bit more, you know, just adventurous in terms of whatever your interests and needs are. Maybe 
uh, you know, but, but really working on, um, on boosting your own sort of self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence in those areas by, by, by expanding, right, in your own self. So it's a very inward process. And then as you, alhamdulillah, start to do that more and more, then what Maslow is suggesting is you become this self-actualized person, which is you uh, morally, creative, uh, creatively, you have kind of reached really the, the best version of yourself and there's all these different qualities that he's identified um, uh, the people who are self-actualized will have. So, you know, and we'll get to those details in a second. But again, this is just really important to understand because as if, you're, if your basic needs aren't being met, then it's going to be very difficult for you to be an effective parent. That's really the gist of this, right? And then, uh, you know, knowing your own hierarchy or knowing where you are on the hierarchy is important, but also children because... There's also a hierarchy of needs for children, and this is also another really important thing that we should understand. The children have also needs, very similar but um, important, slightly different. You know, physiologically, they need, um, you know, uh, uh, healthy food, for example, right? Um, uh, shelter, obviously, and they also need affection. Children need um, touch, you know. And there's, I mean, I remember a long time ago, I watched, um, I don't know if it was 2020, but it was one of these documentary shows. I think it was a, about an orphanage in Romania. And they had shown all these uh, infants, uh, hundreds of them, who had never been held, who had never been touched before because they just didn't have the manpower to be able to tend to hundreds of children. And they found that cognitively, these infants were completely impacted just because you know, they just didn't have human-to-human -human interaction and physical touch. I mean, it was devastating, but we know the power of, of that. So young children, this is really important, you know, that we show them affection um, and that, that's, that we understand that that is a need uh, the, of theirs. And that's why even if you read certain articles about, you know, temper tantrums, you know, if you have a toddler th throwing a tantrum, uh, the uh, sort of authoritative model of parenting would would just, you know, it's kind of like, a you know, they see it as a, a fight, you know, or, or a, you know, pull for power. So th there's like this struggle that happens between parent and child and parent gets frustrated and child is kind of, you know, the, the tantrum goes on. But they, they'll say to you that actually sometimes the easiest way to completely turn things around is just to hold and hug the child. In that moment, you know, the, clearly something is wrong. You know, they don't feel safe. And that's why they're acting out. And it might be some over a toy or over a food or over a shoe. You know, they don't want to wear a particular shoe. It can be a number of things. And so you think, oh, it's such a, you know, little thing. But it, the child, there's something clearly wrong in, in their state. And so just to kind of bring back um, that sense of safety and security for them can completely alter their state and calm them down, alhamdulillah. And it's been an effective model for, for a lot of children. It doesn't always work, but for some children, that's all they need. So just to understand the importance of that. And then, you know, safety and security would be to make sure that as parents, we understand to um, make sure, you know, make certain that the adults or caregivers that we uh, put them in touch with are, you know, um, are safe, are, are you know, are, would never, you know, harm them in any way, but also are just, you know, um, sensitive to, to children. Sometimes, you know, we, we don't think about um, how that can also impact a child is if they're around adults who don't necessarily want them around, you know. So we should be careful to make sure that the company that we expose our children to um, is, is safe in that regards too. And then also, you know, um, um, uh, you know, uh, having an understanding of, of protecting kids in, in other spaces like in cars or, you know, just sort of baby-proofing the home. Um, kind of just being aware. So those are just uh, things that to, to give a child a sense of safety and security. And then obviously free from abuse, neglect, access to health care. These are basic things that all children need. Social needs would be unconditional love. Okay, so loving interaction with their caregivers. Um, room to explore and play and interaction with their peers. So this is a need that all children have. They need a little bit of that, of everything there. They need to be in touch, obviously, with their primary, you know, the caregivers, their parents, but they also need to be with their peers and they need uh, spaces and uh, time to uh, play. And this is something that, again, you know, I've seen time and time again, there's um, some parents just, you know, want their children to um, stand in line or, you know, be in line always and they don't understand children's energy. You know, little 
kids under seven, for example, are in complete play mode. That's just their, their mindset. They're in the world of play. And so they want to run around. They want to, um, you know, explore things and touch things and flip around and wrestle or whatever with their friends. And so if you take them to a space that requires them to just sit for hours and hours and hours, and then you punish them when they act like children, you're, you're not, you know, you need to understand better that it was, you know, that the choice of bringing them to that um, environment wasn't the right choice. It's not that they are misbehaving or that they're acting out of line, right? It's just that it's, it's not the appropriate place for, for that child's needs or, or to be met. Um, and then esteem, you know, children need encouragement. They need protection from bullying, discrimination. And they need respect. I think this is a big uh, thing that's also missing, unfortunately, sometimes, is this idea that children should be respected. Because we see them, um, you know, as little, you know, what do they know? They don't know anything. And there are, you know, sometimes we see them as extensions of ourselves. So we feel we can kind of talk to them however way we want to. Um, but that's, and this isn't the Islamic model. Children deserve respect. And the Prophet I said, I'm, if you read, he, he spoke to children with love, with respect. He would sometimes, you know, come down at their level. He would play with them. He would run with them. And, you know, he treated them with, with compassion and love. And that's because he's teaching us, you know, that don't look down on them just because they are, they don't have, you know, that you see them as, uh, as being subordinate to you. Uh, honor them and respect them. So they need uh, respect. And then... Um, Obviously, they need uh, discipline, but positive discipline, right? So uh, you don't just let them run wild, but when you do correct them, you correct them with, with love. And that will reinforce positive self-esteem because children, it's not that they, um, they can't respond or they don't, you know, the disciplining. That word kind of, I think, has a negative connotation. But if you really, um, you know, look at uh, again what they need they need direction they they can't they need that from us right they need us to guide them so it's important that you you understand that but it's the way that we do it right that's um, either going to make them fall in line and respect us and love us and connect you know uh, uh, strengthen our bond or make them rebel and resent us and so uh, you know parents who have a you know kind of that problem with their children especially as they get older you know you, you look at how it was it done and a lot of times it was done harshly you know if you're going to correct a child and you do it with a strong voice an intimidating voice or posturing or yelling or you you know lewd language which unfortunately some parents do they just lose it in the moment and they'll just something will come out, that's not going to be effective, right? So you kind of have to go back and check yourself um, and realize they need discipline. It just has to be positive. And then um, self-actualization would be, again, um, creative pursuits, uh, learning life skills, hobbies. So really nurturing um, their individuality, looking at them as individuals, which gets back to one of our previous sessions where we talked, again, about knowing... Um, your child's temperament really well because each temperament is going to reveal right um, different qualities about them different um, interests that they may have some temperaments are uh, more again um, just uh, uh, you know they like uh, you know um, social things so you know exposing your children who are social to those types of activities and letting them have bonding experiences, whereas other children are more, you know, analytical and they kind of, you know, are, are hands-on and they, they, they need to be in, in spaces where they can actually be creative and either it's artistic or they build and they do things, again, that are, that kind of tap into that. But knowing your child that well will, will open up, again, um, opportunities for you to help them uh, get to this place of self-actualization. Now, again, why is all this so important? Because um, as Maslow um, uh, wrote about, he said that, or identified, he said that there are certain characteristics of people who are self-actualizers. Um, you know, this sort of pinnacle, when you've reached the height or the, the best version of yourself, you can see people who are like that, they have common traits. And so he identified uh, some of them here, and I just outlined some of them. But they perceive reality efficiently and can tolerate uncertainty. Now, from a spiritual lens, what does that mean? If you can perceive reality efficiently and can tolerate uncertainty, this is submission, right? This is Islam. Because 
you know, when you, inshallah, have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just accept things because you, you believe, right? Qadar wa qadar, if all, it's willed, I, I submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So someone who becomes a self-actualized person can do that effectively. They just accept, even if uh, a loss happens or some other test or tribulation, they don't fall apart because, alhamdulillah, they have the solid foundation. So again, this is a, you know, there's, he's using these terms, but we can look at it from a spiritual lens to see what it really means. They accept themselves and others for what they are. Tolerance. Again, a huge, this is a big part of our faith, to be tolerant of other people and to not judge other people. Um, and to never think yourself better than other people, to be welcoming. This is all part of our tradition. So if you want that for, first of all, you should want that for yourself, these qualities. But if you want these qualities for your children, these are, um, you know, the, the, the things you want to pay attention to. Um, Problem-centered, not self-centered. Again, you know, want for your brother what you want for yourself, you know, being selfless. These themes are constant in our tradition. So to be a, a person who's always wanting to help other people, right, to fix uh, situations for other people and not always me, 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 nafsi, nafsi, this is um, part of our faith. Alhamdulillah, we should all want that. But again, if you're someone who is self-actualized, you will naturally have this quality. And there's quite a, a few more, but um, more concern for the welfare of humanity, very similar to the previous one. Just have, you know, a giving nature. You're worried about other people. You're not always thinking about yourself. Democratic attitudes, strong moral, ethical standards. I mean, subhanAllah, if all of these are not prophetic qualities, you know, I don't know what are. And that's why it's important to contrast. Okay, so we have this list. And now let's look at our Prophet Wasallam because it's important to see uh, the reality of who he was. You know, he was a sadiq al amin the truthful and trustworthy. Never spoke a lie, ever. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. And these are things that we should know. I mean, I know we know them, but to really know them is to, um, you know, uh, to, to obviously take it on for yourself, but also to relay that. I mean, when we talk about these things, emphasize that to your children. Like, subhanAllah, can you imagine that the Prophet said him never once said anything that was untruthful. I mean, that's pretty amazing because we all lie and it's unfortunate, but we do. And here you have this human being who was known even way before he, he became the prophet of Islam, that that was his nickname, to have a nickname that identified this noble quality. He always stood for forgiveness or for righteousness, excuse me, for the righteous. He never was involved in immoral activities. He always in, uh, in, was endorsed or, or was known for his honesty and credibility. So it's really important to teach this to your children. Um, careful, you know, with other people. He was compassionate with the poor, always led, uh, you know, was, was, a, was at the forefront, you know, when he led. Um, and he always adopted good manners. He never hurt anybody. I mean, these are, there's so many hadith that talk about how the Prophet never hurt people. Uh, even if he had something to relay that maybe you know, it was a nasiha for them. He was very careful in how he packaged things. But this is, you know, these are qualities, again, that we um, we should be able to identify, we should want, we should take on for ourselves. And just, you know, for the stood for workers' rights, took stand for animal rights, um, you know, and there's a list uh, there. And then revol revolutionized women's rights, defined battle rules. I mean, there's just so many... Um, and we could go on. This is just a, a list that I found. But mashallah, if we actually took the time, uh, we we could spend for you know days talking about all of his noble qualities. But why is this important again? Because when you look at this list of you know people who are self-actualized, so much of what that means um, is is mirrored in him and who he was, right? Because they're prophetic qualities, and so these are the things that. Something so basic as looking at your needs, looking at your children's needs, and really understanding that hierarchy can open up the potential of, of getting to as you actually realize, okay, so this is the process of how we become better. Meet these needs and, uh, you know, and work on just you know, building, work on building and getting higher and higher. And so, um, uh, and then, you know, this is just advice that he had about behavior that leads to self-actualization. So, um, and I thought this was just, you know, really um, beautiful because children, the way that they experience the world is um, is innocent, but it's also with awe. And 
and I think it's you know it's part of fitra when they when you see a, a child looking at something new for the first time they have this immediate you know connection of of where they're just in awe and I think unfortunately as adults as we grow older and older we we lose that sense of awe um, and it's sad because when you lose that sense of awe at, at you know and wonder about the world it's kind of like you know the world is is the way I look at it, it's like this light that we have and it's just getting dimmer and dimmer because of the way the world is and so we should try to inculcate that sense of awe and that's where really um, you know taking your time seriously and finding moments of reflection is really important because you can't be in a state of awe if you're constantly distracted you just it's not gonna happen you know if you're um, uh, you know there's people subhanAllah and we've seen it right there's people who are standing and I'm not judging anybody individually Individually. I know people, you know, all the, but I'm not doing that. But I'm just saying, just think of, of, of what it would take for someone who's standing at the Kaaba, for example, for the first time, and they're, you know, looking at this incredible structure and everything that it represents. But then they're also at the same time, you know, snapping or, you know, sending videos to friends and family about that. And I know people might do that um, because they're trying to, you know, show their loved ones but I'm just saying that's the degree of how easily we're distracted that we could be standing at a structure that magnificent but then we lose ourselves and so we have to self-regulate and this gets back to one of again you know core quality of, of, of um, being emotionally intelligent is that you know how to self-regulate which we'll talk about in a moment but like really having that ability to say you know what I need to if I'm in the moment doing something whether it's praying or reading Quran or attending a class I really need to just be in the moment and let my heart open up, you know, let my heart open up to whatever's happening so that maybe I do have that aha moment, you know, that moment of like, wow, where something just sort of hits you, you know. But you can't um, experience those things again if you're it's so indulgent, right, that you give in to your every uh, need and thought and distraction and you don't self regulate. So you gotta, you, we have to learn that skill set. Um, but experiencing life like a child to me means having that, being in constant state of wonder of Allah Subhanahu's creation, looking out, looking for, for, for just the you know if you're you know waking up for example at Fajr and you want to just kind of connect. I used to do this. Now it's rainy season, but there there's great benefit in actually praying outside. You know. We're very comfortable in our homes, but if you have this space, a balcony or a backyard, try it one day. Just go outside in that beautiful time of Fajr when it's like totally dark and the birds are singing and it's just you and you're connecting with the creation of Allah Subhanahu and see if that Fajr is anything like your regular Fajr, which is rushed and like, you know, you want to get right back into bed because it's cold, right? But if you prepare and you just really say, you know what, I want to connect. I want to, you know, have that just beyond the the everything that I do every single day, all the distractions, I want to kind of disrupt that and find ways. That's why people and I know I have friends who um, very regularly will go on you know sort of retreats into the mountains. I personally I know there's no greater thing for me than when I go and just disconnect. I love to go to to where the trees are. I love trees. I love mountains. Um, you know I love the water too. But my what really impacts me is just to be in the trees. I just love to be surrounded by that greenery um, and there's you know science to back it up it has immense effect on our our states when we're around in nature just touching uh, grass with our feet not walking on it with shoes is said to have you know amazing effects you know just to de-stress and just just it just affects you in a positive way so we're very much connected to that but that's what you know we should look for experiences like that instead of just the same old same old tired you know routine that we get stuck on because uh, the world is, you know, is like I said, it's a big, huge distraction. But if we uh, seek out uh, these these experiences, then inshallah, we can hopefully return to that state of like Subhanallah, which is what we should want. And that's kind of connected. Yes. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. I'm sorry. Okay, is it on now? Okay, thank you. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Oh, sure. You want to go back to that slide? Okay. Stood for workers' rights. Yeah, these are, I, I just want to make it clear. I didn't put these together. I found them online, but I thought they were a good comprehensive list. And sure. 
And then this is the number five and six if you didn't get it. Um, and so then, you know, the next one is pretty kind of tied to this, right? Trying new things instead of sticking to safe paths. So it's kind of just like looking for opportunities, taking initiative, not just, you know, falling into routine and then um, losing out on time. I mean, there's so much time that we waste. Uh, listening to our own feelings and evaluating experiences instead of the voice of tradition. Um, so, you know, really, again, when you're a self-actualized person, alhamdulillah, you kind of inculcate the ability to discern right from wrong. You, you kind of, you know, you just have that inner voice, inshallah. And, uh, and these are, you know, things that will naturally lead to that. Um, avoiding pretense, okay, and being honest. So people who are self-actualized don't need to be fake. You know, they don't wear masks. They don't go from one group to the other pretending to be something they're not. They're just very comfortable in their skin. And this is, again, all prophetic. Everything we're talking about here is really just following the son of the Prophet ﷺ and appreciating that he made it so easy for us if we just were to pay attention and follow it. But alhamdulillah, you know, these lists are also um, helpful because they, in practical terms, kind of give us, you know, ideas of how to, uh, how to do this. But just, you know, being a very honest person, a transparent person, and being uh, prepared to be unpopular if your views do not coincide with those of the majority, I think, you know, this is something we really should teach our kids because they are a minority, right? Uh, and they need to know that, you know, um, being accepted into the majority, if it means compromising your beliefs and your principles and who you are, um, that's not worth it. You know, you, you, that's not a message that they should, um, you know, you need to just remind them that it's very important that they stand up for who they are and that they, you know, have that, uh, that solid foundation in who, who they are. Otherwise, you know, they, they'll get lost, you know, and, uh, and, um, and just lose out on everything that you've raised them with and all the wonderful experiences because they're trying to accommodate everybody else and make everybody else happy and then they lose themselves and it's just not not possible anyway but something to um, you know remind them about taking responsibility and working hard and trying to identify your defenses so this is really important too because that's your ego you know you, you know being in touch with your to be a self-actualized person you have to know where your own ego um, steps in you know you have to be able to see it if you're talking, you know, in in a in your in a situation with your a family member, and you notice your tone is rising and you're getting defensive, and you know you just you're being critical, you should um, if you're being called out on that, you should you should be, you know, thank you, just like you should um, you know if you're self actualized anyway, you'll accept that. If someone reminds you, hey hey hey, you know your tone, you gotta watch your tone. You're getting a little too aggressive here, or you know. You should be open to that type of criticism, but if you're defensive and you make excuses for yourself, even when you know you're wrong, then clearly there's an issue there. Are there any questions up at, uh, at this point about any of this? Okay. So then, uh, again, we're just kind of summarizing um, last uh, session's um, slides just to kind of bring everybody up to speed. And one of the um, sort of takeaways that I had for people was to... Um, do this with their children, which is to, it's just an exercise we can all do called, you know, code of honor, where they help, uh, we help them uh, understand virtues. And there should be certain words that you um, study together as a family with your children. Words that are um, tied very much to, again, the prophetic model and to what every Muslim should should you know should take on virtues virtues like honor nobility chivalry silence gratitude fortitude modesty we should do studies around what these words mean like what does that mean to you and really get our children fluent in this vocabulary you know because um it's uh if we want them to embody these qualities but they're they don't know even how to identify these terms in real practical ways and, and connect it with their behavior. If you see your child do something honorable, tell them, mashallah, you know, that was a real great example of honor. Don't just say, good job, son. Good job, daughter. You know, we kind of are, we use very easy, convenient language sometimes, but we, we limit them in their understanding when we do that. But if you expand their understanding to, to associate 
these beautiful qualities directly with their behavior, you're likely to have them repeat that behavior. When they give, for example, a piece uh, of candy uh, or something of, that they really, you know, a treat that they really are enjoying and they share it with their, you know, sibling, you know, mashallah, tell them that was such a generous, beautiful act of yours. You know, it's so much like the Prophet ﷺ. Try to think of a hadith immediately, if you can, that connects with that act. So that every time they make a really positive choice, you're reminding them, you're behaving, you're reminding me of the Prophet ﷺ. And how is, that, that's such a positive way of reinforcing that behavior, right? Gratitude, fortitude. So all of these qualities are really important to actually teach uh, these terms I mean to actually teach them as terms to your children and then to use them regularly in your you know discussions with them and then um, another thing is to assign them each the task of creating their own personal code of honor so this would be like an exercise like okay what is how do you, you know you see yourself um, you know, uh, through after, you know, kind of going over all these terms, what, are, what would be your own code of honor that you want to uh, begin, you know, to, to sort of uh, practice, you know, and share that with me? Are there certain things that you want to regularly do um, and share me, share with those, share, you know, with me what those are? What are things that practices that you want to start doing? But helping them come up with that. So then they hold themselves accountable. Like this is the way that I want to behave. For example, I don't want to curse or use foul language. Okay, This is really important. If they take that on as their own personal code of honor, it's not something that you're telling them, don't curse. But they say, I'm going to put this on my list then they'll hold themselves accountable because it's their list, right? Well, this is your code of honor. You said you're not going to curse anymore or you, will, you won't use bad language, not just cursing. Because, you know, um, there's other words that are, you know, that are just low, it's low language that is very popular among children, you know. And so if you get them again into those good habits, but to identify those habits that they want to take on for themselves and then you reinforce them that that was your own list. It's very different than you just telling them, don't do that, that's bad, that's bad, it's different, because you're holding them, or making them hold themselves to accountable, I mean, hold themselves accountable to their own list, okay? So that was sort of, you know, the um, summary of last session. Now, for today, again, oh yeah, please. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, if there's no, uh, I mean, as long as there, you know, the consequences are not harsh on them, but there's always room for, you know, uh, improvement and you're encouraging them to, to just try again, then they won't see it as, as you're labeling them or it's something negative that they did, right? So it's really the way that you package it. But I think it's really important for them, yes, to learn from their mistakes and that at every point, if they do something that they, you know, shouldn't have done, that you gently guide them to uh, corrective behavior and just remind them, listen. And that's why, uh, as parents, we should always c come back on ourselves, you know, and talk openly with your children that I make mistakes. So um, one of the golden rules of parenting is to apologize. If you make a mistake, you know, don't think that, oh, I'm above my children. They should, I'm not going to say sorry to them. This is terrible. If you make a mistake, apologize for it. I'm really sorry I did that. I'm really sorry I said that. Um, mommy made a mistake. Baba made a mistake. Astaghfirullah, we shouldn't have done that. May Allah forgive us. This type of humility is what? Teaching them, A, that you are see your own you know, mistakes as well, that you're not just, you know, standing on your, uh, you know, uh, you know, tower, like looking down at them, and you, you, know, you see yourself above them, but that you see yourself, but also modeling, what you want for them to do for themselves, which is having humility, being able to recognize their mistakes, but model it for them. You know, it's, uh, you can't expect them to apologize to you when they make a mistake or recognize their own if you don't do that ever, right? And then especially as they get older. And we talked about this in previous sessions, but all these things that we do is when they're younger, they will come back to somehow, re you know, reflect whether or not it was effective or not. It'll come back in later years. You'll see it. 
you know, and just be patient. Inshallah, you're doing the right thing. But I, you know, I see it with parents who are very harsh in their tone and very just, you know, like I said, that authoritative, really strict model. Then they wonder why that their children later on in life, you know, in their teen years are really, you know, rebellious and they're slamming doors and they're just, you know, fighting them on every single thing. It's because the model was, was you know, set very early in, in their life and they saw it. They saw how to do it. You taught them. So, you know, we have to stop that from happening. So thank you for that question, though. Um, so for today, you know, just to again summarize, in the very first session we talked about the five uh, characteristics of an effective leader. And these are um, certain qualities that we, sh we all should want which are strong communication, passion and commitment, positivity, innovation, and collaboration. Um, and, the, you know, just these are things that we should all possess, but they'll, you know, in different areas, they'll come out. Um, and so just going back to that earlier slide here, for today, for this, this part of the, the session, I wanted to talk about the potential dangers and threats. So what are the greatest threats and dangers? What do you guys think? Right now, if I asked you what are children, what are the greatest threats um, for children, what would you say? Mm -hmm. So entitlement. Mm -hmm. Okay, entitlement, abundance, entitlement, having too much of everything. Okay, mashallah. Anybody else? Yes? What is Self-identity, very good. Alhamdulillah, self-identity, yes. Pressure, peer pressure you mean? Yeah, peer pressure, yeah, it's a big common one. What else? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely, there's definitely... Um, an attack on on religion, right? And there's, or just faith in general. You know, not just Islam, but faith in general. A lot of people are being attacked that way. Very good, alhamdulillah. So, um, you know, I've identified here that some of the threats are not all, but we have the first one here. I put as that combination of shaitan and nafs. You know, a lot of the parents that I talk to, they're very overwhelmed, they're very exhausted, and they usually have some external problem, whether it's bad company or a lot of times now it's social media and devices, and they're always like, what do I do? And that's what where they think the problem lies, you know, in these external things. But if you really get down to the core issue, it's this issue of what? not being able to self-regulate. You know, the nafs, we're just, we're created weak. We know this from a spiritual perspective. And we need to teach our children as well that, listen, you have this nature about you that is going to uh, fall weak. And you need to learn how to control it when it behaves impulsive, impulsively. Because in addition to this nature within you, there's also this other you know, clear uh, presence that we have. We might not see him, but we have to teach our children shaitan is real and to really help them realize how the combination of these two working uh, together affects uh, their ability to control themselves, right? Because when they don't have that, all of these other things that we've talked about will affect them, whether it's bad company, peer pressure, um, you know, just abundance, all the things that were mentioned it will affect them if they don't themselves know how to uh, to identify their own weaknesses and shortcomings. So what is self-regulation? Um, again, um, you know, let's look at the, the, this term because we should understand it. Self-regulation regulation is the ability to manage your emotions and behavior in accordance with the demands of the situation. Okay. It includes being able to resist highly emotional reactions to upsetting stimuli, to calming yourself down when you get upset, to adjusting to a change in expectations, and to handle frustration without an outburst. It is a set of skills that enables children, as they mature, 
to direct their own behavior towards a goal, despite the unpredictability of the world and our own feelings. This is so important because this is what every parent wants. They want their children to be able to control themselves, but then they don't realize that's something they need to learn how to do. You, you know, nufus, we're all nufus, but if you don't um, give your children the, the tools to be able to, to do this, uh, then you can't expect them. But unfortunately, our expectations are so high of them that it's like a vicious cycle. You know, they do something that upsets us because they didn't maybe, um, you know, exhibit self-control. And then we punish them and then, you know, kind of spirals from there. And it just keeps going and going and going. But if we stop and say, wait a second, I have a lot of expectations from this child who, yes, the world is like this. You, It's like a buffet to them, you know. Uh, they have, you know, access to so many things now and everything looks just so exciting because they're children you know they don't so they need to know how to uh, navigate the world and see it for what it is from a spiritual lens and how to realize that there's certain limitations um, you know uh, within themselves and, and what what those limitations are and also enemies I mean we have a very clear and present enemy the Allah Subhanahu has warned us time and time again he is Adun Mubin. He is your greatest enemy, and he will inspire, and he will, you know, uh, cause you to do things that you shouldn't do. But if we don't make that a reality for our children, and we kind of just, you know, I don't know, Shaitan's kind of like a boogeyman that we only mention, you know, here and there, but we don't talk about it. How it's a daily struggle, and that they have to really take responsibility for their own behavior and to understand how it, how it sort of all works. What does it all mean? Because they're curious. You know, my children always ask me, like, can Shaitan do this? Can Shaitan do that? You know, I have to frame it for them. No, he doesn't have power. All he can do is whisper to us and, you know, plant sort of ideas in our mind. But ultimately, it's our own nafs, right, that reacts to him and, and follows through or, inshallah, is able to see what's happening and then fight off his his whispers but you know children need to again uh, know this so this is an important word term to know and then just to kind of again contrast it um, what does emotional dysregulation look like so for some kids you know if they're not uh, if they don't know how to regulate um, they are highly reactive so this is if you have children who are they get really upset, angry, if you take away something from them and then they start fighting you on it. They don't have strong regulation skills, you know, they just, they self-regulation skills. Um, and then for other kids, it might be something that builds up where it's a slow build up. You know, they might be upset, but they don't quite react harshly in the beginning and then all of a sudden it's sort of like they blow up. Now, I thought this was interesting because if you remember from our discussion on temperaments, right, this very much relates. Right, which is why it's so important to know your children's temperament, um, whether they're reactionary or not, because it will affect how they learn the skill set of being a, a person who can self-regulate or not. If their temperament is reactive, they're probably going to have a harder struggle. Okay, so if you know your child and you're like, wow, they're like intense personality types, they they get ang they anger quickly, then this will be a struggle for them. In, in certain you know areas but but still the information is knowledge you know so when you know this it's not to get down on it but it's more like okay how can I use this information to help them and then um, again for other kids it might you know be a slower process but they may you know sort of um, you know kind of if you see a child and they, they, they you can see them closing up they become very constricted they pull away they um, you know they just they they it's almost like, um, you know, they're, it's, a, it's, it's their way of, of dealing with it, but they kind of know to withhold from you is a way of punishing you, right? So they shut you out. And a lot of parents feel very affected by that. You know, it's like I've had moms who are like, my child was my best friend, and now she barely talks to me. You know, they don't, we don't talk about, because I took something away, or I imposed this limitation, or I imposed this rule. Children know, you know, that they can hurt you that way. And so if you have a child who might not have an outburst, but they know to pull away from you, then you have a different temperament. But this is, again, important because if you want to teach them how to self-regulate, you need to first know what you're dealing with, right? And so um, it says here, a child's innate capacities for self-regulation are temperament and personality-based. 
Um, some babies have trouble self-soothing, he adds, and get very distressed when you're, taking, uh, when you're trying to bathe them or put on clothes. Those kids may be more likely to experience trouble with emotional self-regulation when they're older. So again, I mean, just to see, subhanAllah, it's all connected, you know, uh, to uh, how even an infant behaves can kind of give you a clue about how later on they, they might struggle in certain areas. But this is just really important to pay attention to. And when we talk again about, you know, effective parenting, it's, pay, it's, it's looking at this information and applying it to where your children are at. Do you see certain uh, patterns in their behavior? Do you see certain things that are kind of like, oh, you know, light bulb, like, oh, okay, I, I do see that, you know, them doing that. Then it kind of, again, informs you on how to deal with it. Um, let's see. So, Bismillah. Any questions about this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Very good. So there's, you know, we talked about modeling, and we we'll talk about how you know to help them, but for. In my experience, I think when you break things down for children and you really, you know, teach them these things as opposed to telling them and ordering them, it's very different, right? Because it's like you're you're t letting them know that this is, you know, um, this is how you like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created you this way, and this is, you know, these are the things that you're going to struggle with. But you know, at least being open and having those open conversations. I think a lot of parents, when they look at um, parenting, it's like this control thing it's like they want they wish they could have this remote control to make their kids do you know this and that but i think it's a lot better if you actually just sit with your child and you explain to them listen and that's why you know if you watch the previous sessions we talked about you know that discovery process is really important to go through with your children because once you start getting them in touch with who they are and giving them words like listen this is your temperament type this is your personality type you know, and giving them kind of identifying and labeling certain behaviors. Then when you present this topic of self-regulation, it's like a study, you know, it's not a, a, I'm trying to just, you know, control you and make you do something. It's like, listen, you and I, we're actually in the same boat. I'm older than you, but I'm enough just like you are, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me and you the same test. I'm older than you, so I have more experience than you, so that's why I'm trying to work with you. But let's do this together. And so that's why when I say, you know, really breaking things down for children, I, it's very effective if you do it because what you're doing is you're respecting them. You're respecting their intellect. You're actually, you know, telling them that I, you know, I'm giving you this information not because I necessarily, you know, uh, see you as equal to me. We're not. I'm older than you. I'm a parent. But I believe that you have the capacity to understand it. Right. I mean, if you look at, you know, traditionally speaking, children, mashallah, there's kids all over the world who are learning very high level stuff at a very young age, you know, um, and they get it. But I think, unfortunately, we kind of dumb them down in this culture and we think there's things that are too above their understanding. And so then we just end up talking down to them and we wonder why it's not being received. It's because of our transmission style. But if you respect children and say, listen, this is just the way it is, you know, it's kind of like if they had a physical problem and, you know, and you were, um, you know, giving them, you know, the doctor had a sort of regiment for them and you told them, listen, you know, in order to heal, you need to eat this much a day, you know, you kind of break things down. They'll get that, right? Because they understand there's a physically a problem and this is how we resolve it. So the same when it comes to spiritual issues or emotional issues, when they you know, have a problem that you can identify. You want to approach it like, listen, we're all in this together. I'm, I love you, and I'm, I want to help you through this so that you don't, you're not affected the way you know I was maybe, or the that you could be if I, if you don't know this. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So that's what we're talking about. So the tools that you want to, to give to your children are uh, under, having them have a clear understanding of who they are, how they work, 
Okay, and what I mean by that is there's a physical component, emotional component, and spiritual component. You have to address these things from that place. Like, listen, you know, you're not just a kid that just goes out, goes to school, plays, plays video games. Well, you know, don't look at yourself in, in that limited lens. You're much, you know, more important than that. So having really like in-depth conversations about their nature is really important to help them understand why when you say put the device away, it's not good for you, that they understand, you know, that they're that you're appealing to a side of them that they might not be aware of. They're nuffs, right? Like you're, you need to speak in the, these terms, break things down for them. Like I'm worried that if you don't take control of your nuffs, you can have, you know, this can become, it can kind of spiral and you, something can happen to you. Like for example, with my children, I mean, when they were very young, I introduced the idea of the word addiction to them. I wanted them to know what addiction means. Because even though it's a word that's like, oh, it's, you know, what would a five-year-old do with that word, right? But I wanted them to know, listen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us weak. And if you do something too much, you can actually lose control. And then that thing is like, is controlling you. Whatever it is, if it's eating, right? If it's playing excessively on your phone, if it's, uh, you know, um, doing anything, if you do too much of it, it can end up controlling you. And so addiction is something we should not do. We should not indulge. But how do we protect ourselves, right? We self-regulate. We stop at a certain point. We don't indulge always this need to want to do everything. So they, they understand. And alhamdulillah, they understood that word. So now anytime they do something to a point of excess, I'll remind them. You know, remember what we talked about? The nafs. The nafs is weak and it's going to make you want to keep doing it and doing it, doing it kind of like a, if you if you want candy and you eat too much of it, what happens? You get physically sick, right? Well, with the nafs, if you do something that's not good, you're going to get emotionally or spiritually sick. So they kind of, again, understand. But the tools are really in communication. So when you, you know, there's, uh, there's no magic, you know, potion to this, you know, it's a matter of explaining and really communicating effectively to your children. And so part of the next step would be to actually, as, as I mentioned, talking about shaitan, not as just this scary entity, but breaking down how he works. What does shaitan do? How does he do it? Mm -hmm. I want nothing. Oh, I'm worth nothing. Subhanallah. I mean, that's tragic. But see, this is where, again, you have to break down. Astaghfirullah, you're worth so much. You know, remind them of who they are. Bring that, you know, uh, just look at, go through and, 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 and remind them. Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created you into anything, you know. But he created you as a human being. He gave you the highest you know, level, even uh, if you, if you reach your highest potential, you'll, you you could be above the angels, you know, but they need reminders like that. And, uh, I mean, that's, you know, we can, we can talk about that further, but these are things that clear communication can be very effective in getting through to children. You know, we just have to know how to, uh, to, to word things and how to appeal to their understanding, but breaking things down, I think is what I, I really encourage parents to do instead of just speaking in general terms or uh, just giving orders a lot. I mean, we're very, very good at just do as I say. Just do as I say, don't ask me why. But no, sometimes children need to understand why. You know, if, you, if that's your model, just tell them what to do and they better do it. And then you wonder why they don't respect you and why they don't do it. It's probably because you haven't convinced them. Convince them, you know, get into their rational mind and help them see and give them the benefit of the doubt that they would actually understand it. Yes. Yes, please. Mm hmm. Hmm. Right. Right. Mm hmm. Right. Mm hmm Exactly. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's empowerment when you're constantly, right, to reminding them of their potential and reminding them that, yes, if, if they access this or if they do this, they can reach that level of understanding. So thank you. That's exactly, you know, what, what when we talk about tools, is it's really just giving them more, I think, credit that they, even though they're small, not limiting them to think that, oh, they don't need to know this. You know, yeah, there's certain things that age appropriate, you don't need topics you don't need to talk about, but don't limit their understanding of things that are uh, that are helpful to them because it's very helpful for them to understand their nature and to understand how they, you know, their relationship with Allah and what um, external factors there are that, that impact their behavior, what internal, you know, shortcomings or, or strengths they have. It's important for them to know this stuff. But, um, you know, back to this, shaitan is, is something that really we, we should be able to break down for children and help them understand how he works because we just say, oh, he whispers. Well, what does that mean? Well, he compels you to, towards wrong action. So every single time you do something that you know you shouldn't do, be aware that perhaps, especially you know, as children move out of fitra and they're in that age of you know, discernment and they know right from wrong, that you are you know, under attack, you know? that shaitan is whispering to you and you have a choice to either follow through with what he's saying or listen to that other part of you and, and that conscience you know that tells you oh no i'm gonna get in trouble i shouldn't do it that's that's the part of you that beautiful part of you that you should also you know know about your rule that part of you that is always longing for allah that's always wanting to be better know that part of you as well and know when you're in that struggle you have a choice to make are you going to listen to iblis who just wants to take you down or are you going to uh, you know, uh, fight him off, even if it's a struggle for you. But actually breaking things down, he deceives you, right? He's a liar. So he will distort things. He will uh, make things uh, appear not as they are. For example, that I am your enemy. If you ever have a thought that I'm against you as a parent, just because I withhold something from you, know with certainty that's from shaitan. Your teenagers especially should know that. I can't tell you how many times, especially after events like this or, or any of the events that I do now, I'll get a lot of parents coming up after me with concerns because their teenagers are just, you know, very angry with them. They don't know how to deal with them, you know, they don't know how to deal. And it's like, subhanAllah, the fact that the child is uh, indulging these thoughts of anger towards their parent is a problem because they need to realize what's, what's the source of that, right? Any negative thought towards this, these two people who have taken care of you, loved you, nurtured you since you were an infant, and now just because they don't give you your phone, you can actually build up hatred out of that towards them? That's horrible. But they need to identify, not to blame you know, them necessarily, because they're under attack. You know, Shaitan, he finds ways. This is what he does. And so he's, he's, he knows what he's doing. But let them identify. Astaghfirullah, you're right. I'm so sorry. I, I, you know, I... You know, just kind of, again, come out of that state and realize that this is all deception. He wants to make you think that we are your enemies, that we are strict, and that we're so harsh, and that all these other parents are so nice because they let their kids do this and this. And so he creates these crazy stories, and then they're convinced of that. So every time you, you say no or don't do this, they're, you know, he's, they're under that, you know, that spell. He's deceived them confuses them you know they need to understand if they're ever in a you know moment where they're just not sure about something and then again they find themselves doing something that they shouldn't do he's likely confused their understanding of islam of of your parenting you know uh you know the, the rules in your house just it, it, he wants to again cause that sort of disarray uh, he angers them so this is connected to again uh, what we said earlier, but if they have real serious anger, whether it's towards their siblings or anybody else, they need to, you know, identify the source of that anger. So when we talk about self-regulation, anger, you know, is one of the diseases of the heart, and which we'll talk about next. This is very important to have these conversations with your children. 
identify a your you know how Allah Subhanahu designed you identify the enemies that are around you and within you and then now know how to work on them so um, but anger is a big one which we'll talk about he entices us to illicit behavior so anytime you're doing anything inappropriate this is shaitan and and it's not a scapegoat when it's with children because as adults when you've done something a hundred times okay that's your nafs okay but remember with children they are under attack because shaitan's ammo or his signature style is what you know this is important to know how do you differentiate between your nafs and shaitan your nafs is a repeat offender Okay? So if you're doing the same thing over and over again for 10 years, you can't say shaitan made me do it. Okay, That's just you. That's on you. Your nafs is habituated to something wrong and you need to take responsibility for it. But if you've never done something before and then shaitan inspires you to do it, this is Iblis. Because he's not interested, once you've already habituated something, it's like his job is done in that area he's going to move you on because he wants you to progressively worsen so that's you know for adults this is how it is but for children they're new right they're they're in fitra they're pure they're new to this uh, you know uh, sort of a uh, game that he plays you know so he's going to attack by um, encouraging them to do uh, you know uh, everything that's that's uh, harmful and so when we um, remind them that this is iblis it's not you know, scapegoating. It's actually the truth. And then tell them, but if you keep falling into that, then that's your nafs. You see, now you're giving them clear, something clear to work with. How do I differentiate, right? But this is how you break something down for them, empowering them, right? And then the purification of the heart, this is the next step. If you really want to talk about tools, this is a major component of it. Once you've identified all these threats and dangers, the next thing is to say now let's look at internally what each of us and to include yourself in the conversation if you're going to sit there and do an exercise where you're quick to point out all of their flaws and faults be willing to identify the same in yourself say you know what just like you know sometimes you have um, you know a problem with uh, anger mommy has that too you know I get upset sometimes and I kind of I need to work on that maybe we can look at that section together and look at how can we both because we're both afflicted it's like you know this is just the reality and the, that's why when you study th these things instead of coming to the, your child and pointing fingers and labeling and name calling and coming from that anger it's uh, uh, angle excuse me it's a very different experience because it's inclusive language it's like you know what we're all in the same boat we're all servants of Allah, we're all weak, we're all nafs. Allah has given us all these different challenges, but guess what? My challenge might be different than your challenge, but we're all doing, we're all cha being challenged. But let's, alhamdulillah, look to the tools that we have. Our faith, alhamdulillah, has the answers. We have the perfect example of the Prophet ﷺ. Let's look at what we've been guided uh, to how to remedy these things. So here, you know, learning these diseases are very important. I think there's a total of, um, in the purification of the heart, actually, Here's the text for those who've never seen it before, but I highly encourage you to get it. This is, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf did the translation of this, but how many of you have this book? Okay, if you don't have it, you should get it immediately. This is a wonderful book to use as a, self, as a study for yourself and for your children. But it goes over, um, I want to say 28 maybe diseases, 26 or 28 diseases, but I've just put out a few here. Hatred. A love of the world, envy, anger, ostentation, which is you know pride or showing off, uh, seeking reputation, miserliness, vanity. I mean, these are things children are experiencing right now. Social media alone, love of the world, envy, okay, ostentation, seeking reputation, vanity. You got all of these things that they are engaged with on a day-to-day -day basis are tapping in to these serious diseases of the heart and they don't even know we're not empowering them mm -hmm. of course adults well that's why this parent when we talk about these workshops everything we're talking about really should be for ourselves first because then we can effectively teach our children so you're right it is for adults first but but when we talk about our kids and how much they're struggling with with things if they don't know that human beings 
are afflicted with a certain set of real serious spiritual afflictions, then how do you expect them to self-regulate when they are out in the world, when they're in high school, when they're in college, when they're on social media? How do you expect them to control themselves? If we've never given them the language or the understanding of who they are, where their weaknesses are, and how, alhamdulillah, we have a tradition that has the remedies. We just need to follow through, right? But unfortunately, we're, we, don't, we don't know these things ourselves. And then all what happens is this vicious cycle of reacting to each other. So we don't know something, we don't understand something, and then our children do something we don't like, we get angered, we react, they get angered, they react, and it's just this crazy cycle. How do you disrupt the cycle? We're in this together. Team effort. Please, I love you. I don't want you to hurt. I don't want you to go through things, I, you know, painful things. I want to protect you. And I also need help. I need you to look out for me. You're my child. You know, you can teach me a thing or two. So let's do this together. But this collaborative sort of approach to these topics is much more effective than top down. Top down is what's hurting us. It's what's hurting our community. And I see it all the time with parents who just don't know what to do because their kids have shut them out. They don't want to listen to them. They don't want to talk to them. And they're just like helpless. Collaborate, you know, collaborate, come together and try to bring yourself and, uh, you know, really to that level of like, you know, I need this just as much as they need it. You know, we, we need this together, inshallah. So um, any other questions about this? Oh, another book that I uh, also brought, you know, because this is about character development. You know, it's about really becoming, you know, when we talk about self-actualized people and we talk about trying to be prophetic, we're talking about building strong character. But how do we do that again unless we know what the content of a strong character is? So here's another book. Sheikh Hamza, again, mashallah, he put together a book that, it just summarizes. It's a very simple uh, sort of resource to go to and to study with your children over all of the beautiful characteristics or qualities of good character that you want for yourself and for your children. This is the kind of textbook that um, every home should have, but also family should study together because you can all learn from it. You know, you go through a hadith and it's got the Arabic, it's got the English, mashallah, but it covers everything. Islam is clean, so cleanse yourself, for only the cleanse shall enter paradise. You could have an entire discussion on that. What does that mean? Let's talk about, you know, why it's important to be clean. Um, consideration is from God and haste is from the devil. I mean, that's a huge one because in our world today, kids, everything's so quick, right? Everything's instant, instant gratification, instant access to everything. Here's the hadith. Taking things slowly, being considerate is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Haste is from the ajla min shaitan. Haste is from the devil. Let's talk about that, you know. Yes. You can find these books online at Rumi Bookstore. There's a store right here in Dublin um, and also in Fremont. But they're available everywhere, mashallah. But this one is called The Content of Character, Ethical Sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And then this is purification of the heart. But these are textbooks that, subhanAllah, you have these in your homes and you, you at dinner time, I swear, just try it. Pull it out, open the conversation when you're having dinner, and just see what happens. Sure, you want to take a picture? <laughs> okay, mashallah. <laughs> take a picture. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Of course. But again, you know, very good resources for uh, families to have in their home, inshallah. Um, so are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can message me off, because off the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but I, I, I can send you, yeah, something, inshallah. I, I'm sure I have them. I have a lot of stuff at home, but I'll, I'll send it to you. So she was asking about how to effectively communicate with your children. I think, you know, the fluency of how to, you know, communicate with your children. Honestly, the first part of it um, has to come with being very well versed in who you are, you know, so if you watch the previous sessions, that self-knowledge is really important because once you become very well versed, like for example, in the science of the temperaments, it's a great tool to use to, um, to speak, you know, to, yes, to speak about these things, yes. And so if you're very well versed in yourself, then you can explain it to your children. So I, there's a book uh, called The Temperament That God Gave You. 
you can look at that book. Um, you can find it online anywhere. Also in the libraries, you usually have copies of that. But that's a great book. Um, and I, I did provide some resources in previous um, sessions as well. So you, if, you, if you look at those videos, I have that. But that, that would be a good place to start, inshallah. Are there any other questions or comments? Mashallah, I know there's a lot of uh, insights that you, some of you have shared before, and I welcome that. So if you have any insights, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it depends on the relationship you have with your child. You know, if, if your relationship is, um, you know, where you just speak in those types of very short sentences and this is it and I'm, you know, a topic is over, subject is ended, and there's really no... Um, clear like line of, 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 of understanding between you and the child or respect between you and the child. You're just like, halas, you know, I said it, it is what it is. I don't know if that's effective, to be honest with you, because as your children get older, you know, I think the more we inculcate respect and mutual respect, the better. You know, we talked about that in the previous sessions, but every period has um, a theme. So in the early years, they really need to play. Okay, so between zero or, you know, birth and seven, you play with your children. So you want to be really friendly and open with them. Between seven and 14, this is the period of teaching. And so teachers, the most effective teachers are not the ones that who just, you know, discipline, but actually really connect with their children, right? So you want to teach in that way where you're really bonding with them and that they see you as someone that they enjoy, you know, learning from. Um, and then from 14 on, this is befriending them. So if you look at these three periods, play, teach, and befriend, there's really, I don't think, room in there for just this authoritative model of parenting. It's just, it's not part of our tradition. It's a very, very open, loving uh, atmosphere that in each stage is, is being, is trying, is, is being uh, encouraged, you know. It's to, to look at children where they're at and to really um, give them what they need. So it, you have to know that, but I don't know, in my experience, I, I'm not a fan of that type of parenting, to be honest, where you're just like, I said it, just do it. I think children should be respected enough to where they understand where you're coming from and the intention behind what you're saying. And that cannot happen if you're not willing to communicate. So a lot of times, though, pe people who have that model are just not about communication. They want to say, you know, have one line, and it's understood, and everybody falls in line. It's kind of like a military sort of, you know, approach to parenting. But I don't know if that's effective, uh, to be honest. I I've never, I haven't seen that have long-term effective I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but in my experience, I, I don't know if that's effective. Yes. Mm -hmm. The power of why. Nice. Mm. Oh, nice. I love that. I'll have to look that up. Simon Sinek, the, the power of why. I mean, I, 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 right away from the title, I can see that it's, I'm sure, beneficial. But I, I agree 100%. I, I've, I'm, alhamdulillah, I've been teaching for a long time, and I have two children, but I have nieces and nephews. And I just feel like when you reason with children and you sit down and you talk with them, they will respect you. And, you, and you know, there's two ways of parenting. You can either command respect or you can demand respect. And I think commanding respect is much more in line with our tradition than demanding. If you have to demand it, then you're not, you're not doing it effectively. But when you um, command it, it means you've created a relationship with the child where they uh, trust you, they trust your intentions, they respect you. And that can't happen if you're talking down to them all the time. And unfortunately, in many of our cultures, this is what we're taught. The kids don't know. They just, you know, ah, just tell them what to do. And, you know, kind of it's a dismissive attitude towards children. And I really think it's very, very damaging. And it's, in my opinion, it's one of the reasons why I feel like so many parents are struggling because it's, it's an ineffective model. And you can undo it, though. Don't think it's not. It's too late. Astaghfirullah, inshallah. It's never too late. Always have hope. Just go back to the drawing board and say, you know what? I need to undo certain things that I did with my child and teach or, or let them know that I love them and I respect them. 
and start speaking to them in that way where I respect you. I hear you. You know, as soon as they talk, if you're interrupting them every two seconds, no, 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 you don't know, no. Listen, no, let them speak. Let them, you know, get what they're, you know, out, what they need to say. Even if you don't like it, process it, think about it, come back to it. We're very reactive sometimes as parents because we're, you know, we don't like our authority being challenged. But um, when it comes to especially teenagers, I mean, they're growing, they're, they're becoming little adults. What do you expect? It's not, they're not little kids anymore where, you, you know, they're just afraid of you. So now you have to see them as someone that, you know, that you should speak to as an equal in that sense, like you would another adult, right? So it's, inshallah. But thank you for that recommendation. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions? Okay. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah for um, next session, we'll continue with uh, this list here and talk about, um, sorry, where did I go? Hmm. Protect with preventative measures. Okay. So we'll just continue down this list. Um, okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. We'll go ahead and end it inshallah. We have these monthly. Um, the dates are usually announced. Um, I don't know if there's like a you know a set a date yet for January, but inshallah they'll announce it. Okay, jazakallah khairan. Thank you. All right, inshallah we'll go ahead and end in du'a. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika shalom la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kabiran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa al-asr inna l-insana lafi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر. الحمد لله. جزاك الله خيرا again. Thank you all for coming out. الحمد لله. السلام عليكم.